Olecranon fractures. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Jonathan Gross, and I am Saka Brahman narrating. And in the first video, we already talked about anatomy. We talked about management of olecranon fractures with um, tension banding. We also talked about when you can do uh, excision and tendon advancement uh, in certain select cases, and then we transition to saying when you may have to consider plate fixation, and that's where we're going to pick up in this video. We'll, we'll talk more about complex cases, when to use plating techniques, and then talk a little bit about outcomes and complications. So how do you decide plating versus tension band wire? Well, you want to evaluate a combination of dorsal cortex. Uh, if intact, tension band wiring um, is frequently appropriate, but if a comminuted, you have to start thinking about plate fixation. So evaluate the orientation of the fracture line. Uh, is it uh, transverse? Is it oblique? Uh, and if oblique uh, or complex, then you may need to consider plate fixation. So plate fixation is indicated when you have comminuted fractures, if there's shaft extension, if you have a more oblique fracture line rather than the typical, you know, not typical, but rather than a transverse fracture where you can get good uh, tension band compression. Um, traditional plate options are things like low contact dynamic compression plates, uh, reconstruction plates, one third tubular plates. But currently, uh, the uh, more modern options are anatomic uh, locking plates uh, in you know, different sizes. Um, some of these are plates designed specifically for the anatomy of the proximal ulna. Uh, and where you can get screw placement is crucial for stability. So here's an example, 59-year-old woman, right-hand dominant, lives alone, falls, unable to extend the elbow. So what do we have here? So, you know, take a minute, look at this fracture pattern. Is it simple? Is it oblique? Not really simple. Is the dorsal cortex broken in more than one place? Yeah, it is. And there's comminution. So, you know, this is not really a case that you're going to, you know, firstly, it's, it's operatively indicated, right? Patient uh, has multiple indications for operative fixation. Uh, and, um, you know, this is a patient where you may want to consider anatomic uh, locked plating. And uh, tension banding is not a great option. I mean, the fracture extends fairly distally. And this is not really, you know, a very elderly patient. You know, she needs that uh, to use that arm, lives alone. And um, so excision and tendon advancement, not really the best choice here either. So um, what plate, anatomic locking or traditional? Well, uh, what kind of fracture pattern you have here? It's oblique, there's segmental involvement, it's comminuted. Um, so with traditional plates, um, you have to consider where your screws going to be able to be placed and what kind of screws you can place. Um, you know, so here's an example of a traditional plate on the left and then one of these sort of anatomic plates where you have locking screw options on the right. Um, and as we've been talking about, as that fracture gets more distal and more oblique and more comminuted, you know, you go away from tension banding methods and you're start starting to think more about plate fixation. So another case, 63-year-old woman falls in the outstretched hand, otherwise healthy, uh, unable to extend the elbow. So what do we have here? And I would argue this is not exactly, you know, an olecranon fracture. It doesn't really involve the olecranon process as much. This is more of a you know, proximal ulna fracture. It's, it's very distal. There's it. It's oblique, perhaps a little comminuted. You know, so it's not an olecranon fracture. So you're not trying to convert that tension to compression. Uh, it's not really amenable to tension banding. Uh, this is something you would treat with uh, plate and screw fixation. So how did these do? Um, this patient's 20 degrees to full, um, to full flexion, um, restoration of function. But uh, the problem is all fixation um, was prominent and in this case required uh, 
plate removal. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So when to use locked plating. In general, locked plating is used when you have uh, osteoporotic bone. Uh, it can be used in you know, bridge plating scenarios uh, in general throughout the body when we use locked plating. Um, so in, in this case, it's helpful in fractures that are comminuted. Um, removal of hardware is unfortunately something that is done very frequently with these injuries. Uh, the implants are fairly prominent. Uh, they're fairly subcutaneous, whether you use tension bands and wires or you use plates. And plates are probably, you know, in terms of implant bulk can be even more prominent. Um, very high rates of uh, symptomatic hardware. Uh, so with locked anatomic plates, uh, it can simplify things. It can accommodate uh, the anatomy uh, a little bit better, that proximal varus, as well as that sort of four degrees of dorsal angulation. Um, they allow for locked configurations. Uh, they can get very, very proximal if you have multiple fragments. Uh, if you go, do go very proximal, you're gonna have to do a more extensive triceps split, but it can improve your fixation here. Disadvantages are it can be sometimes uh, a little more difficult to contour anatomically. Locking configurations don't necessarily prevent violation of uh, proximal articulations and are certainly more expensive. And they're certainly not necessarily less prominent uh, in most cases, especially when applied directly dorsally. So anatomic, you know, is what we call them. They don't necessarily perfectly accommodate, you know, the anatomy in every patient. Uh, typically, most plates have two proximal lengths, so one can be a little bit shorter. You know, we're talking about uh, the proximal end here, uh, which doesn't require as much splitting and elevation of the central insertion of the triceps, uh, but you don't have as many screw fixation options. And sometimes that plate can extend even further up the olecranon process. So you really have to, you know, split and get your tendon more out of the way. And, um, but you have more fixation options there if you need to. So, if you have shaft extension, um, you will have to have to consider plating, uh, and you may have to think about where to place your plate. So um, you can, if we've been talking about plate being very prominent when it's very dorsal, you can also place it laterally. Uh, you can even place the plates uh, or smaller plates on the medial side as well, um, but um, your, it compromises to some extent, you know, how well you can fix, for instance, up into the olecranon process and the coronoid process. Uh, the posterior plate allows more uh, advantageous screw placement into those locations. Uh, I haven't talked too much about reduction techniques. A lot of this is direct reduction, but you can sometimes do some indirect reduction as well. Uh, with uh, in, in highly comminuted fractures, with uh, mini distractors or fixators. Um, and we'll also show how the plate itself can act as an indirect reduction tool if it's properly contoured. Here's an example of a 73-year-old uh, woman who fell down the stairs landing on her elbow with immediate pain, inability to move the elbow. So what's the fracture pattern? Well, if you stop and look, you'll see there's a coronoid Fragment is the olecranon fragment. It's really a trans-olecranon fracture. Um, so, so what are you going to do? Well, you try to simplify the fracture, um, provisional reduction, and plate fixation, uh, as shown here. So, uh, you know, th this is not a case for you know, tension banding. Um, this is. Um, good case for plate and screw fixation. Another example, concurrent coronoid and olecranon fractures. 55-year-old male uh, man uh, falls from a stepladder, also with uh, olecranon and coronoid fractures. Here are those fragments again. So understand, you know, what are the forces displacing those fragments, right? It's going to look something like that. So this can be operatively treated with uh, open reduction internal fixation, reduce the shaft of the coronoid fragment, lag the shaft um, to the coronoid fragment and then reduce and stabilize the olecranon fracture. And here you can see a pre-contoured anatomic plate. So uh, sometimes using the, if the plate is properly 
contoured and you're reducing, you know, you're using the plate uh, to help, re you know, get indirect reduction of the fragments, that can help in some of these challenging cases as well. So let's look at that idea again. Here's another complex proximal ulna fracture uh, involving the olecranon, the ulna shaft, the coronoid. Let's look at those fragments again, the coronoid, the ulna shaft, and the olecranon fragments. So understand the displacement, you know, why are those, or what are the mechanism and sort of deforming forces causing those uh, fragments to displace. And with all the comminution, how are you going to hold the reduction and repair the coronoid fragment? Well, you can use the distal humerus also as a template. So you can use the plate, you can use the distal humerus, and you can stabilize and temporarily pin the coronoid to the trochlea using that distal humerus as a template as you then reconstruct everything. So does the implant matter? Um, tension band wires versus plates. We talked about tension banding in the last video. Um, well, you know, the, the union rates tend to be good, but the reoperation rate, rates are pretty high as well with both tension band wiring and plating. Uh, but we see probably a few more wound problems, deep infections and superficial infections, um, maybe more with tension band, but the, the, the more serious complications we will see with the plates. You have this large implant directly under the subcutaneous tissues uh, in many cases, and um, uh, that can potentially lead to you know, more problems with wound healing and infection. Uh, but all of these can be prominent and require removal. So you get hardware symptoms, depending on the studies, 3 to 80%. Uh, very high percentage requiring hardware removal. Uh, although these generally do heal, you can sometimes get infections. Uh, with the K-wires, you have to watch for migration of the pins. That's reduced a little bit when you engage that anterior cortex. That's the reason we talked about in the last video uh, to try and en engage the anterior cortex if possible. Heterotopic ossification uh, is also a risk. So here's a few studies that have talked about uh, problems with the hardware, skin breakdown, infection, prominent implants, um, very high rates uh, requiring um, removal due to pain and sometimes restriction of motion. Tension band wire versus plate, um, similar DASH and um, range of motion, DASH scores or outcome scores. Um, Tension band wires in this study had higher rates of symptomatic hardware, but plates had higher rates of major complications like infection, wound healing problems, and need for revision. So some take-home principles. Treatment of olecranon fractures requires an understanding of the fracture pattern, the patient's functional demand, and understanding what your options are. So who is your patient? What are uh, his or her demands? What's your fracture pattern? Is it associated with other injuries? And then if you have to operate, go through your checklist to develop the most effective and cost-conscious treatment for the patient and the fracture. So also just keep in mind, uh, we didn't talk a ton about elbow instability, but occasionally you can have these transolecranon fracture dislocations that are associated with elbow instability. Uh, so uh, we didn't talk about that as much, but that is also another phenomenon that uh, you have to treat very carefully. Be aware of associated radial head-neck fractures and coronoid fractures when you see a proximal ulna and olecranon fracture as well. And that's covered in, in a different lecture uh, and video. So here's some references. Uh, I'm going to go through these one by one uh, or slide by slide uh, that you may want to uh, look up. Uh, here are some other more uh, classic papers that um, you may want to take a look at, as well as some more recent references. And some of these were referred to in the slides in this lecture. Thank you very much.